avenues, it can be said that the non-energy sector will play an increasingly important role in supporting economic growth in the years to come. And this can only be achieved by working together with an evolving consumer. We foresee that the modest GDP growth in Trinidad and Tobago will likely remain steady for 2015, bolstered by the expansion of the non-energy sector. This expansion will be the major driver of economic growth, led mainly by the consumer. Consumer loan growth remaining robust for now is a good sign, coupled with low unemployment, both doing their part to support household consumption. Wage increases both in the public and private sectors in the last few quarters have also helped bolster household incomes and encourage consumption. Indeed, it is the customer who will dictate the levels of efficiency and cost effectiveness that we must all feature in our distribution systems. We are all very aware that it is this very customer who has the power to substitute most of our products with the click of a button in the new era of online shopping. This should be a very sobering reminder that the customer is king. A fundamental shift in our business philosophy towards demand chain management can be a game changer of our day-to-day -day logistics decisions. This does not mean that we should become oblivious to the need for a viable supply chain. In fact, any astute entrepreneur will appreciate that both supply and demand as the core tenors of a free market enterprise must both be well managed and understood respectively. On the supply side, we as manufacturers are compelled to search for more affordable ways in which our raw materials can move from A to B, a process that can be very simple or very complex. New investment in R&D may also lead to discovery of, of raw materials that can be produced by our companies or otherwise locally produced, which could reduce lead times, ease, ease cash flows, and could effectively take away several elements of the supply chain, adding value to our businesses and the economy. Success in this regard will position our businesses to adapt more readily to changes on the demand side, as we will be able to exact greater control over our inputs to production. While this illustration may seem simplistic, as it excludes supply limitations of dealing with bureaucracies, problems with our ports, limited access to foreign exchange, traffic woes, and of course, labor supply and productivity, it is the unmistakable quest for leaner, more effective business operations that will shift our paradigm towards catering for the needs of our unforgiving customer. The TTMA considers it an opportune time for our manufacturing sector to become the economic driver of our economy by taking on the mandate of diversification. To do this, we are tasked with taking on the dynamic demand challenge, doing what it takes to compete both locally and globally in the midst of trying economic times. Indeed, adversity creates opportunity. And so we are actively in search of the opportunities that lay ahead for us. On another side, the fast-growing IT and innovative business models have also drastically changed the practice of supply chain management all over the world. Many of us had to quickly realize that we must continuously seek out the insights and tools required to remain relevant and competitive in our industries. In this context, supply chain innovation is crucial for any company's future. Regardless of current oil and gas prices, 
both our hydrocarbon and the manufacturing sector have created a platform that is still economically solid enough for us to do what is required to forge new conditions for growth. It is my hope that the new political administration will work closely with our manufacturers to make the transition as seamless as possible. We are pleased this morning to host this session in collaboration with the Arthur Lockjack Graduate School of Business. And I urge all of you to take advantage of this meaningful opportunity to learn and ask questions. As the manufacturing sector seeks to do its part in driving economic growth, now more than ever, we must partner with each other to learn new techniques, share information, and make this a success for us all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today, and I trust that you will benefit from our panel discussions. Thank you very much, Mr. Alcazar, for your words, highlighting the concerns of those within the manufacturing sector the need for supply chain innovation, as well as your hopes for the future. Welcome everyone to this morning's event. From supply chain to demand chain, new challenges and solutions for the manufacturing sector. My name is Fayola Nicholas, and I'm the Director of Advancement and Alumni Relations here at Arthur Lockjaw Graduate School of Business. And it is our pleasure to host this event in collaboration with the Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago Manufacturers Association. I trust that you had a good breakfast this morning, yes? And you're ready for a morning packed with discussions on our topic, am I right? And I hope that you'll be able to learn something today that you'll be able to carry back to your organizations and implement to make changes for the future. In order to kick things off and to set the foundation for our conversation today, we will have Professor Miguel Carrillo. Executive Director of Arthur Lockjack Graduate School of Business and Professor of Strategy, delivering a very short presentation that will assist us and open your minds and open your questions, hopefully, to our conversation later on. Join me in welcoming Professor Carrillo. Good morning. Buenos dias. Uh, all protocols observed. Welcome all. I was reflecting last night uh, about what, what could be the best approach to discuss today about manufacturing. And it occurred to me that, you know, why don't we just try to mention a few of the challenges that we have today and most likely will have tomorrow. The number one challenge Definitely, and I think that you all are living that, is that change, in, it's that the cost structure in our manufacturing products keep changing more and more and more every day. Although labor costs are still maybe the most important ones, overhead rates uh, are still um, predominant. And interesting enough, in a small volume country like Trinidad and Tobago, that might be our biggest challenges. In the absence of economies of scale, our cost structure will always be a challenge, especially because we won't be able to have access to these economies of scale. So labor will, won't be, will always be a huge part of our variable cost. Raw materials as well. And this, and not only that, it's not only labor, but labor productivity, which is always a challenge. Now, why I'm placing energy there? Well. We know that we all have access to low energy prices, but I can guarantee you that most of your plants or operations are much more inefficient in terms of energy use than any other in Jamaica or Barbados. We are quite bad at using energy. We're good at producing energy, but we're not, we're not good at consuming energy. And that is a potential issue in the long run. Obviously, the exchange rates, um, on an issue, the inventory carry on, and this is a particular issue. <coughs> um, 
I've been able to take a look at many, many large companies, distribution companies, by the way, more than half of the companies registered in Toronto Tobago are distribution companies. And the cost of, uh, of carrying inventory is huge, gigantic. And um, it is mostly because of two things, because we're not as good, well connected to the world, actually. And the second is that we don't have, uh, I will say, a sophisticated technique for, for demand planning. And the other you know, interesting cost structure is that nowadays equipment are in, in practice depreciating faster than before. It is very tricky in manufacturing to buy new equipment, new technology, because most likely what we're acquiring might be second or third generation, not really state of the art. So it's a very tricky thing. And you know, this is a you know, big change uh, in cost structure. And there might be a few solutions here, like distributed manufacturing, like new shoring, or further automation. That I hope that we can discuss this in, in, a, in the panel. The challenge number two is the globalization of manufacturing. Uh, although a lot of logic behind manufacturing is, is based on the location of a particular plant, more and more, you, know, you, you see countries like South Korea emerging as powerhouses for manufacturing. What's interesting is that manufacturing now is becoming a little bit more and more competitive globally, and the competitive arena is moving from manufacturing to logistics. The companies are able to move around their products uh, faster and better, more efficient than produ only producing them, will actually be the winners. Now, what's interesting is that the, 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 if, if you take a look at the Boston Consulting Group, um, the Boston Consulting Group has a very interesting index. It's called the Cost Manufacturing Index. Uh, they, they basically take care of about 20, 25 countries where 90% of their, um, of, of, of basically with more than 90% of exports um, uh, based on the, on, on, on the GDP. And apparently Mexico and the USA are the rising stars right now. The ones that are combining more best practices globally and one of the interesting things that is emerging big time is distributed manufacturing, which is, you know, we will do one part thing here, one part there, uh, assemble one, one aspect, and then we will consolidate another location. You know, usually one of the interesting things about multinational companies, or even more so transnational companies, like the automakers, they have extremely sophisticated logistic operations. If we think about the Hyundai, you know, We'll think about Hyundai as what? It's a car company, right? But it, it's in a initial um, origins. Actually, they are a shipbuilder. They move into cars. Um, and then one of the things that they start to do is like, they say, we're very good at putting together stuff that moves, you know, like ships, like cars. So instead of moving things, you know, this way, you know, what, what can we do to kind of leverage our manufacturing capabilities, start moving things vertically instead of horizontally, so then they move into um, elevators as a business, which is fascinating. But one of the things that they realized is that they, they had so many uh, parts that were moving from all around the world. They had so many operations around the world where, where they were consolidating that they realized that they, they had developed a very sophisticated logistics and supply chain which now they sell um, as a service to other companies, which is fascinating. So prime manufacturing or competitive global manufacturing requires now, more than ever, a great management of the supply chain. So there's a lot of solutions, with this, which is offshore, new shore, uh, having international joint ventures, you know, where you, you, you can link your production with a, 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 a company that will give you access to economies of scale or access to global supply chains. And I, I am writing there international joint ventures and not only contracts. One of the biggest issues here is that we have very few proprietary brands in, in the Caribbean. Okay. So what we do is our competitive advantage might be our exclusivity of distribution of a particular brand 
But as we have access to one brand, the trade-off of that is that we cannot develop our own brands. And not only that, unfortunately in the Caribbean, in a special trend to Vigo, we are not very good at international joint ventures. We really don't like to share control. It's either you buy me or, you know, I buy you, but partnering, no, no, no. I want, I want to be in control. And this is actually not, this is against, you know, what is happening around the world. Uh, but in terms of the solutions and challenges, we will discuss this in the panel as well. Um, challenge number three, well, everything now is more unpredictable than ever. And it's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? With all this access to, to data, information, uh, all the science around, you know, what's happening in the world, the internet, well, we were supposed to have a more predictable world, right? But apparently the more we know about the world, the less we know about what's going to happen with the world, which is, it kind of blows my mind, honestly. So we, we really have no idea about the demand, what's going to happen. I'm pretty sure that you guys have been trying to do your budget for this year, right? Who, who, is, who is actually doing the budget for this year? You guys? Hasn't been a nightmare for you? What is an animal, to prepare it or to defend it? The thing is, we have so many assumptions that we cannot back up. And, and as a school, we're living that ourselves. The volatility of uh, uh, raw materials prices, the volatility of regulations, the inconsistency in certain policies, right? The supply chain, sorry about the, the type of chain, speed, Climate change, climate change is a big issue now, right? And it's affecting us, and it affects manufacturing as well, because we generate spikes of demand and um, valleys as well. So flexibility is now critical, which is interesting because whenever you invest in a manufacturing plant, you invest with the purpose of producing A, B, or C products. So flexibility is something very difficult. And more and more, with all this 3D printing and so on and so forth, there is more and more mass personalization of low-cost products. No? And this is basically flexible technology, manufacturing cells, what is called on-demand manufacturing. Imagine that we can have on-demand manufacturing, not built to stock, not built to plan, but built to demand, really, which is very interesting. Distributed production, digital connectivity along value chains, which somehow we have all the technology, but our connectivity is still not quite right, not quite poor. And this is something that I think it's critical to inject science and analytics into understanding the demand, into forecasting. Fortunately, companies that I visited that have manufacturing or you know, distribution operations, and when you ask them, okay, how do you estimate demand? How do you do it? What is the logic that you follow that will trigger your purchase orders of raw materials or products to distribute? Mm. Most likely, if we have this uh, good, it's history of the last year, or the buyer's gut. That's, but uh, it's quite unsophisticated, that part of demand estimation. Now, what's interesting is that customers are not looking for products anymore. They're looking for solutions. They're looking for experiences. They're looking for stories. Who you agree? And whenever we focus our operation, that, you know, in, you know, focus on, uh, which is product-centric and not customer-centric, that is the moment where we're going to start losing uh, our competitive position. You know, usually... Um, the customers keep demanding more to package their products with other services. And this is interesting what's going on, for instance, in the, in the cement uh, arena in the world. Cemex, basically, yes, it sells cement and concrete. One of the critical aspects of uh, how they have been able to add value to their customers worldwide, whether they are in Egypt or Ecuador, okay, is by making sure that they have the logistics to deliver a truck full of concrete in less than 30 minutes. 
that is adding value. That, that is not manufacturing. That is logistics. And one of the things that it's important to know is that whenever you, you, you sell a product, you have to understand that the product is not the most important thing that you do. The most important thing that you do is that you deliver value you know, around, that, around that product. And, and that, that is very, very important <coughs> to, to understand. It. And, and, and examples of that you know, is critical. I don't know, you have, um, you have gone to Ikea. You know, it's interesting, you know, this uh, Swedish retail store is full of very cool stuff. But you go to an Ikea uh, in the US or, or whatever, what you're going to see is that you don't only buy a product, but you basically what you see is an experience because the products are showcased in an actual, the, in the way they actually look in the, in, at home. So you have to, instead of focusing on adding only functional features to your product, you have to be sure that through your product, you're creating value to the customer. And maybe it's not only you that deliver the product, but you actually coordinate the efforts around the value chain. So for instance, you are an airline. And yes, as an airline, uh, you don't own the parking lot. But you can actually issue, as part of the ticket, you issue uh, a code where the person could go and park uh, you know, there, let's say, for a reduced, reduced fee. You are orchestrating value to your customer. You're offering your customer solution. So this is very important, right? Uh, <clears throat> design is key. You know, if you don't have a distinctive feature, if you just keep manufacturing a commodity without designing it around the customer, that is going to give you uh, trouble in the, in, in the future. And this is important. Consumers are really now, especially younger ones, pulling for, pushing for ecological products. If this is no, not inserted in your, in your pro portfolio projects, this is an issue. And obviously, we are not in the in manufacturing. It's not anymore in the economy of production. It's an economy of solutions. <clears throat> now, the use of relevant technologies is a big thing here. Uh, as you know, there are many primary technologies. And there are many solutions. But let me just go to this. Look at the list of all the primary, you know, under technologies that we can access for manufacturing. ICT, advanced materials, sensors, biotech, sustainable green technologies, numerical modeling and algorithms, mechatronics, which is obviously robotics as well, photonics, knowledge systems, microelectronics, tribology, nanotechnology, networks, artificial intelligence, and human machine interface. I would like to know exactly, you know, in your budget, how much you have in CapEx to invest in these technologies, you know? Okay, well, let's talk about secondary. Mobile internet, knowledge-based automation, the internet of things, big data, cloud computing, autonomous robotics, energy intelligence, which is something that we urgently need in Trans Tobago, additive uh, manufacturing, printable electronics, integrated safety system, low-impact transportation, virtual manufacturing, all this. How much are we focused on these things in Trinidad Tobago? How much technology are we injecting into a process and therefore into a product? And I think that's a big, big here. So we have to dramatically increase our technical skills in these areas. Uh, obviously, the champions tend to be the, um, the Germans in mo many of these. Genera generate fiscal incentives as well to promote innovation. And invest in technology not only to manage the supply, but to manage the demand. Okay, this is very, very important. And uh, this is some sort of evolution of, uh, uh, of the manufacturing uh, arena. This is uh, what is projected for the next uh, 10 years or so. Uh, minimize material inputs, waste management, which is something critical. Increase energy efficiency, which we don't do basically anything in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, reduce water usage, improve efficiency in, in land usage. And this is what's happening in the UK. Uh, uh, business leadership in, in uh, low carbon tech. But this is what they see, our, our uh, friends in the UK, in terms of where the, the, uh, the manufacturer is going. They're, they see new forms of value associated with products, including sustainability. See, it's not only the product, but adding value through the product, through solutions. Products remanufactured instead of becoming waste. The refurbish will will actually become maybe the new standard. More durable products, 
Designed for shared ownership. Isn't it interesting? Shared ownership because of the length of product. And, you know, hey, I, I buy a car, and, you know, that car will last maybe 20 years, and it's going to be owned by me and my son, let's say, you know. Spare capacity built into supply chains to ensure resilience. And one of the reasons of this is mostly because of issues with climate change, which is quite interesting. Now, beyond 2015, what well, they see is a resource-constrained world where more and more we have to use smaller amounts of materials and energy. Um, there is this uh, material is not landfill, but it's kept in a productive loop. Cleaner and quieter factories, closer to consumers. Why? To reduce the supply chain uh, cost, okay? Close to consumers and supply chains with spare capacity at all stages. So look at this, you know, supply chain, how important it is. How important it is and how critical it is that factories keep becoming closer and closer to the sources of demand, right? <clears throat> and this is very interesting. This is what is called by...